from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good morning. I'm Jane McAuliffe. I'm the Director of National and International Outreach at the Library of Congress. And it's my pleasure and privilege to welcome you to the Library of Congress National Book Festival and to one of its two stages that we have devoted to the art of fiction writing. National and International Outreach is the division of the Library of Congress that is responsible for this wonderful event. The division was created just a year ago to enhance the library's efforts to serve Congress, the American people, and the world, and to foster partnerships with other cultural and academic institutions, both in this country and abroad. The Library of Congress is thrilled to present this annual event for the 16th time. We certainly could not offer the free celebration of books and reading that this is without the generosity of our donors. The Library of Congress is your nation's library, and I welcome you to visit us in person on Capitol Hill or online at www.loc.gov. Today, we have an outstanding lineup of authors on this stage. They are among our finest writers, and their subjects range thematically from the intersection of rural life and faith to science fiction, from espionage and romance to stories based on real life events. The theme of this year's festival is journeys, as represented by the art on our festival poster. Books take us on journeys, often to places we would otherwise never venture. Fiction in particular challenges us with new perspectives and opens worlds to explore. In addition to the author presentations you will hear today, please visit the expo floor at the low, lower level where you will find family-friendly activities, you'll find the Pavilion of States, and you will find the Library of Congress Pavilion where you can learn more about your national library. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker for the first time to a National Book Festival stage. Avid reader, children's librarian, professor, deputy commissioner, and then chief librarian of the Chicago Public Library, and CEO of Baltimore's Enoch Pratt Free Library, please welcome to the podium a woman who recently added a new title to her resume. Ladies and gentlemen, I present you the 14th Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. Wow. Thank you, Jane. Welcome to all of you, the 16th annual Library of Congress National Book Festival, and my first official event. Can you imagine what this is like for a library? <laughs> this is a marvelous, marvelous way to start uh, my tenure. And the theme of the festival this year is journeys. And I'm going to be inviting everyone to journey with me on Twitter as I discover so many of the treasures of the Library of Congress. So we're starting, in fact, we've already started today. Uh, Stephen King has already re retweeted, and <laughs> so it's it's going to be something. But it this today it is a, a special uh, pleasure to be able to present the Library of Congress's Prize for American Fiction, which recognizes the contributions of an American literary author whose body of work is distinguished. And the prize has been given to such notables as Toni Morrison, Philip Roth, John Gresham. And this year, the Library of Congress is presenting the award to a person that many of you know and who has touched 
readers around the world. The recipient of this year's award is Ms. Marilyn Robinson. Because we are live on Facebook, I am going to just give you just a little bit about uh, Ms. Robinson because she's the author of books that have touched us for over two decades. And she has been an award winner of, and I'm looking at uh, my, uh, Look at these awards, the Pulitzer Prize, the Penn, the Hemingway Award for First Fiction, and then 24 years later for Gilead, she received the National Book Critics uh, Circle Award and the Los Angeles Times Prize. She is what you would call the epitome of an award-winning uh, author. <laughs> and she was, in this instance, roundly and unanimously nominated for this prize by a jury made up of Nobel Prize winners, Man Booker Prize winners, prominent literary critics, and former winners of the prize, the ones that I just mentioned. And as Acting Librarian of Congress David Miles said at the time, with the depth and resonance of her novels, Marilyn Robinson captures the American soul. We are proud the Library of Congress to confer this prize on her and her extraordinary work. Please join me in celebrating the winner of the 2016 Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction, Ms. Marilyn Robinson. Marilyn, what a joy to, uh, and what a privilege and an, and an honor to be here. Uh, I'm someone who has been a devoted fan for, since 1980, since your first novel, and have followed your work as so many of us in this audience have and beyond this audience watching. Um, it's, it, it's very rare, I think, that we have uh, uh, an American author, contemporary American author, who digs down and uh, speaks to us, or doesn't really speak to us, shows us, it, it brings out in us somehow uh, themes of conscience and loneliness and, and faith and uh, love in the way that Marilyn Robinson has. I have to admit that I am, uh, in full disclosure, uh, avid partisan, uh, unabashed partisan, uh, I was on the jury, uh, I was fortunate to be on the jury uh, as the chair of the Pulitzer Committee that gave Marilyn Robinson the prize for Gilead, of which I'm very proud. A wonderful, wonderful, resonant book. Um, Marilyn, I want to ask you, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, how it is, I mean, these unforgettable characters that you, that you paint for us, that you engrave really uh, very deeply in our souls. Uh, these are characters that come obviously from, not only from your imagination, but also from a deep sense of your spiritual self um, and perhaps of the spirit of all of us in, in a sense. Can you tell us a little bit about um, where these spring from? John Ames, the extraordinary uh, hero of Gilead and who appears again in Lila. It appears throughout in the, tri in the trilogy, really, uh, of, of uh, Gilead and then Home and then uh, Lila, the most recent novel. Uh, all of these characters, it's, it's, it's a little bit Faulknerian in the sense that we go back to, to Gilead in, in Iowa. Um, tell us a little bit about where they come from. You know, I really don't know. <laughs> I know that's not a terribly useful 
response, but it is interesting from my point of view that I can't write unless there is a character in my mind. I have to wait for them. They're not ideas of mine. Somehow, or, I mean, you know, somehow or other, a voice emerges or a character. And surprisingly, when I begin to have the conception of the character, I really know quite a lot about her or him. I, it's, it's, a, it's an uncanny experience, really. I, I assume that what I do is sort of watch the world and glean traits, and mannerisms, and attitudes, and so on out of you know, my encounters with people in general. Not because I intend to, but you know, p things stay in the mind. Um, that's the best I can say, actually. How, did, how was it that John Ames, which is such a distinctive voice, the pastor of the church, uh, uh, one of the churches, because Boughton is, uh, is that how you pronounce it, Boughton? Boughton. Boughton. Boughton is, uh, is fellow uh, uh, reverend in another church. But how, is, how, did you, how, how did that voice come to you? Because it's a very distinctive voice, and I think we could all sort of hear it and summon it, uh, your readers. Well, um, I, it's kind of a long story. I was in a hotel in um, Provincetown. Um, I was going to spend Christmas with my sons, who neither of whom was married at that time. And so I had a room for me and a suite for them in an otherwise empty hotel on the tip of the Cape. And it was very beautiful, and they were both delayed coming. And so I was there in this solitary hotel in this wonderful winter sunlight streaming in through the windows and so on. And I always have a notebook and a pen with me, you never know. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this voice, the first sentence of Gilead is actually the first thing that came to me in that voice. And I was surprised, frankly, because having only written housekeeping at that point, I assumed that I would always write from a from a woman's perspective. And then here was this man <laughs> talking with me, in effect, you know, some, who had read all the same books I had. <laughs> um, and it was, it, I really enjoyed writing that book. It was easier than, I think, any of my other books because I, I actually positively enjoyed spending time with that voice. Mm. It's a marvelous voice. And I, you know, I don't want to suggest that there's um, anything Manichaean in, in your worldview, uh, but there is a sense, uh, you get a sense in the book that there's, there's uh, you know, the good soul and then there's the troubled soul. There are the, or the difficult life and, and, the, um, and, 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 and the good life, the, the uh, introspective, studied, uh, spiritually thoughtful life, and then the, the sort of uh, the person of abandon a little bit, who's a little on the wild side. Um, there's a, it's, not a, it's not black and white. I don't want to suggest that it's black and white. But there's always a sense of a kind of a struggle uh, between the, the people who have strayed, shall we say, and the people who are trying, trying very hard to stay the course. Um, and Naturally, uh, you are someone who is, uh, uh, you got your doctorate actually in English, I believe, mm -hmm. but someone who has studied theology and, and religion uh, for a very long time and steeped herself in, in that. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, that sense of your, uh, maybe even biblical sense of, of right and wrong, and good and bad, and, 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 and uh, grace and evil. Well, I know that you don't want to be Manichaean, but you're a little more Manichaean than I am. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, um, I mean, this may be related in a way to the way I think about my characters as sort of given to me rather than inventions of mine. I, um, I don't, you know, even biblically speaking, you know, there are lots of people, you know, like David, King David and so on, who, who err enormously and are nevertheless very important, very highly valued people. Um, I don't think we can actually, I mean, I think that a life 
like Jack's, shall we say, that that uh, that encounters a great deal of sort of psychological discomfort and all the rest of whatever you want to call it. Uh, I think it can be absolutely as precious and in, in a way as aesthetically satisfying as a life like John Lane's, which basically, uh, what should I say? <laughs> he does not expose himself to a world of temptation, or John Lane's, you know mm. what I mean? He lives in, is very aware and even uncomfortably aware of living within uh, a very highly defined role and history and all the rest of it. Um, I don't, I, I think that there are very, very many ways for people to be um, aesthetically interesting, shall we say. And, and I, my own particular theology suggests very strongly that God is sensitive to these aesthetics. And, uh, you know, beyond that, I don't particularly judge. Hmm. Well, I certainly get that sense. Jack, of course, is is uh, the character that uh, was present throughout, in a sense, at least in in in, in um, it's part of the the whole constellation of the trilogy. But um, he is uh, the son of Reverend Boughton. Uh, I get the feeling, though, in Lila, for instance. I mean, here is someone one isn't sure. Uh, she's she's. She's very much uh, attracted to, and even and, and loves, uh, and says she loves uh, uh, John Ames, uh, Reverend Ames, and and his what he represents, and finds him beautiful, and in, and in, in, in in so many ways, uh, we're not sure she's going to stick with it somehow. I mean, you, we end the novel uh, wondering whether she actually. Uh, and she's landed, you know, sort of in this wonderful spot for somebody who has had as troubled a life as she has, uh, and yet there is that still that remaining kind of wildness. There's a deep goodness in her too. So I understand about mm -hmm. what you're saying that we are not all black and white at all. Um, but uh, Lila, tell us a little bit about her. Well, you know, I there were things that I knew about Lila from Gilead. I mean, she's, it's funny, she's sort of there in my peripheral vision, you know. Um, but I, I mean, it was consistent with what I knew about her that she had to be outside the kind of acculturation that produced people like John Ames, you know. Mm -hmm. He has a whole vocabulary to describe and, and to, you know, to explore uh, things that are important to him. I wanted her to be in her own way without any of that apparatus of learnedness and tradition and so on, to be as good a theologian as he is. Mm -hmm. And she is. She good. is. She's the, one, she's the one who is reading the Bible and telling at least the reader in, 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 in the words of the book. Yes. Yeah. yes. And that's a, that's a wonderful sort of, uh, uh, I think, device because she's uh, she very much a deeply spiritual person herself. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, one thing that I liked about making that character is that, you know, when you really look at the Bible, it, the, the orphans and the widows and so on are really the text, you know, how well are they cared for, how much are they acknowledged and so on. And all the kings and so on just rise and fall depending on their adequacy to this population that would be like Lila, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Lila, for those of you who have, you really must read this, this book and the whole trilogy, but Lila is someone who has had a very difficult past in poverty and, and um, very gritty sort of childhood and, and uh, young womanhood. And she comes to uh, marry Reverend John Ames, who is uh, obviously deeply in love with her and has lost his former family and, and is, is deeply in love with her. Um, but there is, uh, there is another character in this novel that I want you to talk about because it, is, it was very present in my, uh, as I read it, it is the knife that Lila <laughs> carries. And it is very much a part of her identity, very much a part of uh, her relationship with her adopted mother, if you want to call doll adopted mother. Um, but there is the knife, you know, and the knife is very present. It's almost like the, 
that Chekhovian thing about the gun, exactly. you know, it has to Except go off. Except I broke he, the rule. You broke the rule. <laughs> the knife is never used. The knife yeah. is, to pair apples it is yeah. used. Yeah. <laughs> yes, to pair apples it is used. No, that's funny because that's such a byword at the workshop, you know, the Ch Chekhov saying if there's a gun on the mantle, it has to be fired before the end of the story. So, <laughs> a little act of rebellion on my part, perhaps. Right. <laughs> yeah, there's a knife packed right here, and it's never used. It's very, very present. You're very aware of it, and you're, you worry that it's going to be used. Or it's, 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 her, it's her inheritance. It's her inheritance. It's everything she has. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's quite wonderful. Now, I have to, um, to say, Marilyn, you were, you were born in, in Idaho. Your uh, father, if I remember correctly, was um, in timber. His, uh, lumber, we Lumber, call it. lumber, <laughs> lumber. <laughs> um, and your, your mother worked at home? Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, she was a classic, classic housewife of the period, yes. Right. And you grew up in, uh, it seems to me, I've never been there, but in that uh, beautiful sort of lake area, which is, which is, which is beautiful and, and full of nature and, and inspirational in that sense, your writing is um, full of nature. And it's very important to you, I, I believe. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, well, I think that probably growing up where I did, where, you know, the Latin, the, wild landscape seemed so authoritative and enormous and the human landscape seemed so minor and mm -hmm. perhaps temporary, you know. Um, and it, I've never stopped being aware, you know, I mean, it, it's like an ingrained habit of, you know, everything, I mean, trees, you know, I mean, what can I say? Nature is extraordinary, very beautiful, very complex, inexhaustible in terms of the attention you can give it, the interactions of light with leaves and all the rest of it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's on my mind, it is. It feeds you, in a way. Yeah. Well, it just, it has, it, it assumes a lot of authority for me. I think that people live on a natural landscape uh, and it's more consequential for them than they perhaps are actively aware. Mm -hmm. There's a, um, uh, there's, a, there's a quote that I want to read to you um, that um, was in the New York Times, and here it is. And it's talking really about Home, which was the second novel in the trilogy. And it is a book unsparing in its acknowledgement of sin and unstinting in its belief in the possibility of grace. It is at once hard and forgiving bitter and joy joyful, fanatical and serene. It is a wild, eccentric, radical work of literature that grows out of the broadest, most fertile, most familiar native liter literary tradition. I think what, I believe that was A.O. Scott who wrote that, and I believe what was being, uh, there, there's this, sense of you as a uh, sort of theological scholar and you as a novelist. Mm -hmm. And you wear these two hats and you, you uh, of course, you're also a, a professor of literature at um, the Iowa Writers' Workshop, very famous workshop, has produced, a, you have produced a lot of uh, wonderful <laughs> students, I must say. But you wear these hats. Uh, so there's the, the theology hat and there's the there's the, the novelist hat, and there is the teacher hat. These are all very different. Uh, and, um, I happen to know a little bit so, something about this, because you really have to take off one hat to wear the other one fully. Um, and yet, you know, here I am with my Manichaean view again, <laughs> um, trying not to be. But, and yet, oh, they all merge in a way in your life. I think you, the, 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 the theology, the spiritualism, the, 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 the notion of, of uh, the importance of faith, and you are a deacon in your church, I believe. In Actually, I was voted off the board. You were voted off. <laughs> <laughs> we want to talk about that. <laughs> My attendance was too bad. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, you see, so the, 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 the good and the bad do mix, <laughs> after all. <laughs> but so um, the, 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 the business of, of, on the one hand, being somebody who is uh, steeped in imagination and is pulling things really out of the air, because that's what a novelist does. It hears voices. A novelist is a person who hears voices, pulls things out of the air, creates a world. And a um, theologian, to my mind, is someone who struggles with the world that is and where one fits in it. Uh, and then the professor is one who is, is trying to lead, you know, in the manner of uh, a pastor, trying to lead a sheep to some sort of form of understanding themselves, really. Um, so how do you do this? How do you wear the hats? And how do you, how, and no. do you see them as hats? Or do you see them as all one thing? Um, they, they're pretty much one thing for me. I, um, teaching at Iowa, I just resigned at the end of last semester. High time, I might say. <laughs> but in any case, um, it was a wonderful place for me. It was absolutely ideal in the sense that I, I would teach a literature seminar. We all do, you know, one per semester. And we can teach absolutely anything. So whatever was on my mind was something that I could organize a course around, you know, a lecture course. And, and um, it, it was phenomenally rich because there's really no greater privilege than talking about your favorite literature with these very gifted writers. I mean, that, that's excellent. Um, I had a, I, I've been very much influenced by 19th century American literature. I think that's clear. And I, was often teaching Moby Dick or, or Faulkner's novels or something. And they're very, very full of religious allusion. I'm, Moby Dick is just saturated with it. So I started really seriously reading theology, reading specifically what Melville would have been familiar with, which is Calvin, you know. Um, and uh, so the, the theological and the literary were very much intertwined. I think somebody writing in the 19th century would have sat through hours and hours and hours of theology in church. Um, and we basically too many times get a sort of minor uplift, <laughs> something that uses a little sports language, a little advertising language, you know. Um, <laughs> and so I have to read theology in order to know where, you know, Melville's mind would have been, or, or Faulkner's for that matter. Um, and so, basically, I, you know, these, these things were all one thing in that sense. Hmm. You have said in, in, in your book, because, uh, of course, Marilyn, aside from writing these extraordinary gem-like novels, also writes, uh, uh, publishes books, uh, essays. Um, uh, her most recent one is The Givenness of Things. And what you say in The Givenness of Things that struck me is that you think that we have gotten to the point where there is um, precious little joy in our lives. I, how did you put it? The, uh, the spirit of the times is one of joyless urgency, you say. Um, and that we're all sort of um, I, struggling for the, uh, uh, the great god Mammon or something, and, and we're, we've forgotten, uh, we've lost our way in, in a sense. I think we are di distracted from joy. Mm -hmm. I think that we're, we live in this continuous conversation that implies that everything has to be re-geared and everybody should really be studying, you know, computer science and you know what I mean and everybody's going to be unemployed and you're going to have to make yourself ingratiating and useful to any theoretical employer and all that sort of thing. You know, it's a terrible thing for kids to think that, that they have to, you know, instead of thinking I love Keats or something, they're thinking how am I ever going to pay off my loan? Who's going to hire me? You know, this is a huge step down. From, from the way that I was educated, for example. I mean, I was educated in the old days before feminism. I was educated generously and elaborately, and I don't think anybody had any notion that anything would ever come of it, you know? 
<laughs> and, you know, I mean, it's always half, you know, the glass is half full and so on. But it was a great privilege to be educated simply in order to be educated. I think that's one of the best things you can experience in life. You have, uh, speaking of education, you have contact with, um, with people who are not particularly educated. You, uh, last night we, at the Authors uh, Festival Celebratory Gala, which was a, a bit of a pep talk before we all came out to the festival today, you said that you had worked with incarcerated people and, and you had had a chance to talk to them. And, and one, one quote really struck me in speaking to a man um, I wasn't sure whether he had, you had given him the book, but he had read a book and he had said something about the fact that I didn't think the world would interest me as much as this or something yeah, like. Yeah, found out the world would be interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, these are, in Iowa, it's not uncommon for writers to be invited to come into to prisons and talk with people who have read their books, you know. I mean, they have a reading group, you know, bless their hearts. And um, the, so I've never had any formal relationship with this. It's just that when I'm invited, I come. Um, I find that people in prisons are extraordinarily good readers, you know. <laughs> um, they have not nearly enough distraction to keep them, you know. Um, they really, uh, they love books. Books are intensely important to them. And so it's wonderful from a writer's point of view simply to talk to people for, for whom they have such meaning, you know. Um, I was very, Grinnell College uh, actually gives classes. This is all donated time on the part of the professors there. Uh, they give classes at a rate that end in a, in a degree from Grinnell. Um, and that, you know, a fair number of, of uh, inmates actually pass through this and, and leave prison with a college degree. I mean, I, and a good college, you know. I mean, well, they're all good. I don't want to. But uh, <laughs> um, in any case, it's a, it's a kind of a part of the culture, I think, that I have been drawn in on and, and very feel very privileged to have been drawn in on. I, as it happens, the man that I quoted was a cab driver I, who drove me home from the airport in upstate New York, who had spent 11 years in Attica. I mean, he'd spent years in Attica, but 11 years in prison altogether. And the other was a little, God bless her, woman in Pocatello, Idaho, in a women's prison there. Um, but you know, the, the, the urgency which, with which they are touched by books, uh, it's uncanny, it's magic, it's beautiful. Um, and and I, t I do always tell my students, you know, to write a book, write your books for the woman in Pocatello, you know, give her that good book. They take it very seriously, bless their hearts. <laughs> There's, um, you, the, the remarkable thing, of course, is that um, a book is an object, a static object that sits on your shelf and uh, until you read it, until you engage in it. And then the, all the work that the writer does in a solitary fashion is done by you as a reader in a solitary fashion. And it's very rare, I think, that we have the chance to actually hear beyond the covers of that book the, the feelings and aspirations and, um, and concerns of, of a writer. So it's uh, really wonderful to have Marilyn present here today, to have her receive this marvelous honor, which the Library of Congress um, conveys, and the poetry and Literature Center is very much a part of the Library of Congress conveys. And um, it is, you know, the, 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 the human speech, in fact, I, I wrote this down because uh, I felt so um, uh, sort of 
a little bit uh, awestruck by the way that we were going to have to communicate something about so such beautiful books in human language like this, you know, which is so imperfect. And it reminded me of something that Flaubert said in Madame Bovary. And he said uh, uh, something that, here it is. Human speech is like a cracked kettle on which we tap crude rhythms for bears to dance to while we long to make music <coughs> that melts the stars. Well, Marilyn Robinson, you make music that melts the stars. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.